Hello, friends. How we doing? Welcome back to another episode of the New Evangelicals Talks. In this one, whoo, I've been getting some amazing guests on the podcast, and this is no exception. I had Brian McLaren on. He wrote this book, Life After Doom, Wisdom and Courage for a World Falling Apart. Brian, if you want to know Brian, you really should. He's been around for a long time, one of the early emergent church movement leaders, uh, phenomenal author, and so I had him on to talk about climate change. Yeah, he's writing a book on what do we do in the face of so many different crises, is that the word plural? I don't know, crises, whatever, but uh, so many issues that are facing our time, including the climate and what we do with that. So this is a deep conversation. We cover all different aspects. We talk about the bad, but then we talk about life after doom. Like, what does that mean? What does it look like to face empire and to say, we have to do better? So man, what an honor it is to have Ryan on the show. He's become a mentor and a friend, and I'm so grateful for his work. Friends, thank you for being here. If you like this episode, give us a rating and review. Give us a subscribe to the podcast channel on YouTube. And we are a nonprofit holding space for thousands of people as they navigate a better path forward in their faith. If you want to support the work that we do, you can donate. All of our work is paywall free. What does that mean? We have no Patreon account. There is no secret episode if you pay us X amount of money. Nothing we do, whether it's our community stuff, our Zoom groups, our podcasts, our YouTube, whatever, there's no barrier financially to entry. And that's made possible because of people like you. Again, if you want to support our work, you can click the link in our show notes. All donations made in the U.S. are tax deductible. Your donations are the lifeblood to making this content possible. Enjoy this conversation with Brian. Talk to it. All right. Well, uh, you know, Brian McLaren, it's great to have you on the podcast. This is, I told you this, I think, in private, but this is truly a full circle moment for me. Because I read your stuff when I was still in my evangelical days. Like I read your work on the Emergent Church and all that stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, Brian McLaren, like he writes some great stuff. And, you know, here I am now, you're on the podcast. We're talking about a new book that you've written. We've become quite friendly behind the scenes over the past few months. It's just a real honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Well, let me say, I listen to your podcast and I love it. So I'm really happy to be on the show too. Wow. Oh my goodness. That, that is, that is crazy to me. Well, uh, like I said, your work in so many ways, I mean, arguably has been one of the most influential people. I think for a lot of folks navigating a better path forward beyond that basement of fundamentalism that we always talk about. And you, yeah. I mean, you've written a lot of books, a lot. Mm -hmm. I think your most recent one up until this point was, do I stay Christian? Is That's that correct? Right. Yes. That book. I listened to it on audio, legit brought me to tears. Like I felt so seen in her. I felt like, oh my gosh, exactly. This person gets exactly what I'm saying. So I want to thank you on behalf of the audience that that book I think is just such an important book for us to read because it, you really weigh out very honestly the pros and cons of like, hey, do I stay? Do I go? And I think, you know, for me, I found a very compelling case in the reasons to stay, but I like that you also give compelling reasons for people to go, right? Where they yeah. say, you know what, you know, Brian, I, I read the book and um, I landed here and you're like, hey, I understand because there are yeah. some compelling reasons. So <laughs> thank you for yes. writing that book. It, it really means a lot. It really does. Well, thanks. Um, okay. So we're talking about a new book that you've written because that's just yeah. what you do. You write amazing books. Life After Doom, Wisdom and Courage for a World Falling Apart. This book comes out, what, in a few few months? Yeah, in May. Middle okay, of in May. May. Awesome. This book, as far as I understand it, is really about addressing climate change. Is that correct? Well, yeah. You know, there's a term you may have heard, uh, Tim, people are using called, the, the term is polycrisis. Mm. Because when you take climate change, and you look at that, you say, well, we could solve this, except for the fact that we have these people undermining democracy and funneling more and more power to a super wealthy billionaires, and they're working against dealing with climate change. And uh, and then we've also got this problem of white Christian nationalism and white supremacy and various forms of religious nationalism around the world. And, and you start putting all of these different problems together and more and more people are feeling, well, the, the way I use the word doom, life after doom, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the end of the world uh, uh, in that sort of sense. I'm talking about the feeling that descends on a person when they think we are in such deep trouble. Each of our problems is making the other ones worse. I don't see a way through. And that feeling of just being overwhelmed is the, is the context for the book. 
Well, um, man, it's again, like you're back in my head and in the head of many of the audience because I hear from them all the time. And I yeah. think about this too. I mean, lately I've been thinking a lot about how we live in the world's wealthiest country. We're still worried about, about medical debt. We know that, yeah. like you said, white Christian nationalism is a thing. Democracy is under threat. Wages are low. The middle class is slowly being erased. And you know, it's just, there's so many, to your point, there are so many different things that are each in their own right, their own crisis. Yeah. Um, and then we also have climate change, right? Now, I've talked to people like Catherine Hayhoe, a leading climate Scientologist oh. on the podcast before uh, with her book um, that came out a few years ago. And so, yes. you know, I do think that in the progressive evangelical world that I occupy, because a lot of people are navigating their own personal maybe trauma or just a yeah. better way forward mentally, climate change kind of takes a back seat, even though we all know it's a major issue. Yes. So I think it's important that we have books that are like, actually, no, this is actually potentially one of the biggest crises because if we have no yeah. environment to live in, none of this other stuff matters. <laughs> yes. Not only that, but every issue we care about is going to get worse as the climate is under greater stress. Uh, w when the climate's uh, uh, unstable, our economic systems are unstable. When our economic systems are unstable, our political systems are unstable. Also, our religious systems, because when people are tight financially, they find it harder and harder to give. <laughs> yeah. um, so you put all those together and we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, one of the things I try to do in the book is help people see that climate change is, pardon the pun, but the tip of the melting iceberg, mm. because underneath it, is the larger problem that I call ecological overshoot, or this is the technical term for it. And ecological overshoot simply means when we are sucking more resources out of the earth than the earth can replenish and pumping out more waste products than the, than the earth can neutralize or detoxify, then we're in a situation where we're destroying our own life support system. And the problem is we have been doing that intensely for the last 40 years, We've been doing it uh, destructively for the last 200 years, and we have been on this course, you know, for a very, very long time. So uh, overshoot is the deeper issue that I, I think, and this is where our faith comes in, mm. I don't think we're going to be able to deal with the deepest root problem without a deep spiritual transformation. And it's not bringing people to where we are as Christians, but it's helping Christians and others move to a new place that I think will make us better Christians uh, in, in the long run and help Hindus be better Hindus and Muslims be better Muslims too. Yeah. So in, in the research for the book, is that is that what you really found that like over the past 200 years or so with the Industrial Revolution, that's when really this, this crisis started to really develop very quickly because of just how resource heavy those systems are and how we're not able to, re the, the earth isn't able to heal as quickly as we're damaging it. Is that kind of how, sure. what, what we're talking about here? Yeah. So look, the, the big deal is fossil fuels. Like the, uh, toward the end of the book, I have this chapter where I talk about what I've been learning in the research process and, yeah. and epiphany moments. And one of them was the almost magical power that fossil fuels have. Like mm. if, if you were to say one barrel of oil, I don't know what the current cost is, but it usually hovers, you know, slightly under, slightly over a hundred dollars. Right. One barrel of oil. Uh, it would take one individual working full time between six and nine years to produce as much work, physical labor, as can be extracted from one barrel of oil. Wow. You, 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 I mean, when people let that sink in, the incredible, and, and it's not a surprise because when you think about it, Fossil fuels were made by the bodies, the decaying bodies of living creatures who absorbed sunlight over millions of years and concentrated it in this, this uh, black substance. Mm. Um, so uh, when we discovered fossil fuels, it set us on a course that has brought us to where we are. And um, so, so it's not just the, the fossil fuels, it's that they made it possible for us to dig deeper and faster and plow up more things and create more chemicals. And you put all of that together. And we've been on this accelerating hockey stick of a graph toward facing the limits that for those of us who take the Bible seriously, whether or not we take it literally in the very second chapter of Genesis, human beings are given limits. 
And, mm. and part of the essence of the wrong that's committed in the early chapters of Genesis is refusing to live within very modest limits mm. uh, that we were given. Yeah, you know, this is actually a good point just for the audience to kind of hear as I'm unpacking it with you. So th the big issue with fossil fuels is not just the emissions that they emit, that is a part of the problem, but that it accelerates our ability to do things very rapidly and very quickly that can include how we harvest minerals, how we, you know, chop down trees, how we build new systems, et cetera. So it's not just, I mean, the emissions are a huge part of it, I'm sure, yeah. but it's also the fact that it's kind of been like hitting the fast forward button exactly. on the tape. Right. And just made us really go real quick. But the earth is still at normal speed. So put it put it this way. Who would have guessed this? People will be shocked to hear this. One of our big problems right now is we have a shortage of sand. Now you think, hold it. The ocean's covered with it. <laughs> okay, what? But when we build, we make concrete and concrete requires a certain kind of sand. It requires sand with rough edges. The sand on the beach is smoothed off. It's little round spheres largely. So sand that can be used in concrete is, is we're really running short of it, right? Well, why is that? Because we've, because fossil fuels have enabled us to build so much more so fast that we've used up all the easily available or most of the easily available construction sand. So everything gets accelerated. Mm. Our population skyrocketed. The amount of uh, almost everything that that growing population uh, uses has skyrocketed. So not only do we have more people, but we have more people eating more beef and more pork and more chicken. N something as I worked on this book that just shocked me. Like I, it's it, the full impact of this hasn't sunk in yet. Right. But, you know, if, if you were to say to people of all the mammals on the earth, what percentage of them are chickens, pigs, and cows, right? Um, when okay. you look at the biomass of domestic animals, we're squeezing wild animals less than 20%, less than 50%, less than 15%, less than 10%. And so all of what we will call wildlife is being replaced by domestic animals because we eat more, because we have more prosperity. And all of this comes from uh, this sort of magic potion that we discovered of fossil fuels. I mean, it, hmm. if for folks who've read C.S. Lewis, it's a little bit like Turkish delight. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> okay. Yeah. Now I grew up in conservative evangelical yes. spaces, right? Yes. I w grew up on a steady diet of talk radio, Rush yes. Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, yes. uh, Michael Savage. I can name them all. Bob Grant yeah. back in the day. I mean, I had all these people in my head and, it seems like the narrative that I understood was something along the lines of this. Hey, climate change is greatly over-exaggerated. Yes, yes, the climate is changing here or there, yes. but it's probably not man-made. The, the earth has normal cycles. And then my evangelical upbringing would reinforce that theologically by saying, listen, we're called to have dominion over the earth. The earth yes. is here for us to be able to use to yes. promote human flourishing and human life. Yes. Give me your response to that kind of rhetoric now as you did the research on this. Okay, so much to say about this, Tim. Let me <laughs> start by saying that Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and uh, all the others, they actually provide a great service. They teach people to be skeptical of the claims of other people, mm. but they do us a great service. They do not teach people to be skeptical of their own claims. Mm. Um, they, they draw people into a group uh, that's skeptical of the other political party or the right. other economic system. And they never, and, and meanwhile, they play every trick of misleading people that they accuse the other side of doing. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, when you stop and say the fossil fuel industry has known the damage it was doing since the 1970s, certainly the 1980s, and they hid that information and they started funding fake think tanks to put out propaganda. So whether Sean Hannity actually believes that stuff or whether we should be as cynical of Sean as he is of other people, I don't yeah, know. Right. But but what they end up doing is promoting massive amounts of of information. Um, uh, so 
it, here's what I'll say as someone who spent, I, I wrote a book on global crises in 2007, 2008, and, and I became, uh, unusually, uh, informed about our situation during that period. And then in the years that followed, I've kept up with it, but I did another deep dive. And here's what I could say. Anyone who has not studied our climate, our climate crisis and the larger ecological crisis of overshoot, anyone who's not studied it, all I can tell you is it is so much worse than you think. Mm. <laughs> I'm not even asking you to study it. Uh, I mean, if, because if you do, you're going to have to deal with psychological stress that you, you know, a lot of people know this young people, millions and millions of young people around the world are saying, I don't want to have children because mm -hmm. the amount of information they've taken in has made them think we are in so much trouble. This doesn't seem fair. Right. Mm. So the thing I can say is they are wrong. Um, the, the uh, and the information is readily available and so is the propaganda. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the chapters in the book, I do a, I, I did a deep dive over the last couple of years in all of the um, climate skepticism uh, literature, and I took seriously, uh, you know, chased everything down that I could. And so, yeah, it is dangerously bogus. Can I give you just one quick example? Please, the floor is yours. There's there's a guy who's very big on on. Uh, on YouTube and on all is interviewed by all these people. And he says, here, here's what he says. Uh, he says the leftist woke, you know, mob tells us that carbon dioxide is bad, but carbon makes plants grow. And so we're by putting more carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, we're the best friends of the environment. We're saving the earth. We aren't destroying it. Mm. So, I mean, that statement gets cheers and applause and makes people feel great. He tells people, we aren't creating trouble. We're heroes. People love it. They eat it up. It's like a jelly donut for crying out loud. Uh, all fat and sugar, you know, but it's just a lie. It's just false. Uh, and the examples go so far. It just shows incredible e either ignorance on the part of this fellow or or deception on the part of, of this fellow. Just a quick example, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yes. Every time it rains, a little bit of rainwater mixes with carbon in the carbon dioxide and falls as carbonic acid. Uh, when carbonic acid falls in the water, it acidifies the water and the oceans are becoming more acidified. When oceans become more acidified, all of these little plankton that use uh, that that uh, try to, that need to build little shells um, and uh, a zooplankton they're called and there are phytoplankton this affects too they can't survive in a slightly more acidic ocean when the plankton in the ocean decline the little fish decline when the little fish decline the big fish decline uh, you create these cascade effects mm. wow. and that sort of simplistic statement look I'm a preacher I know that. <laughs> There is a temptation to say the things that get you applause and amens, right? Mm. But and that kind of talk, you you I've listened to so many tapes of these people and they get all of this applause. And it is so sad and so dangerous. One thing I appreciate about appreciate about you is that you're willing to really think through like how someone else would see something to better understand so we can respond to it, which I, I appreciate. In your estimation, as you were writing this book, and you know, as someone who's been involved in in understanding the, our climate crisis, what is the main motivation you believe for the fossil fuel industry and for others, and even these pundits, to maintain this illusion that hey, actually, it's not yeah. really as bad? Because if they do know that we're heading towards a crisis, they have to know that long term this affects them too, even their business, right? Yeah. So, like, what 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 am I missing here? Why would someone go? Exxon, for example, hey, you know, let's just kind of suppress some of this data because we yeah. want we want profits early. I mean, is, is it a profit thing? What, what, what's your best read on that? Yeah, I think it's complex, Tim, mm. is, is an honest answer. I mean, here's the, the truth. Nobody becomes an executive in Exxon or BP or, you know, wherever. Nobody comes an executive there without spending years in the business world. Right. And and. The business world is geared toward not asking, is this moral? Is this healthy? Is this good long term? They're geared toward the quarterly reports of shareholder return. Yeah. In fact, until a few years ago, 
It was illegal in the United States to build a company that mixed shareholder return with social benefit. They had to create a new kind of uh, they had to create a new kind of corporation called a B Corp that made it legal to put social and environmental benefit as a legitimate form of government. Mm. Uh, I, I'm sorry, a legitimate form of corporate structure and corporate uh, planning and, and leadership. And so uh, I, I think people get shaped by this sense. We're making a lot of money. Our shareholders are making a lot of want money. The entire economy is built on fossil fuels. Yeah, Changing will be difficult. Mm -hmm. And and here's the other part that gets into it with politics. Uh, I, I was in a meeting, I tell the story in the book of evangelical leaders called the Sandy Cove Conference. And at the Sandy Cove Conference, they brought together environmental leaders across denominations and parachurch organizations. I was so excited to be there, although I, at that point, I wasn't really considered an evangelical by a lot of people. It really is my background, and I love the evangelical community. And I was thinking, I'm going to meet the other evangelicals who care about the environment. Well, it turned out that very few of them knew much about the environment, but um, mm. uh, but they brought in incredible leaders. People would be shocked to know that the former head of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was an evangelical Christian from England named Sir John Houghton. And Sir John made a brilliant presentation there. Uh, uh, by the way, the uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is the largest joint scientific endeavor in the history of the universe on Earth, um, meaning more hours of more scientists have have gone together in this collaborative venture to understand the Earth's climate system than any other project, moonshots, developing the atom bomb, everything else. This is just the largest project. And the head of it was an evangelical Christian. And so he and other evangelical leaders made presentations. And by the end of the first morning, everybody was convinced this is real. And, and, and the Bible calls us out of love for God, love for neighbor, love for this precious earth to, to do something about it. The leaders of a particular denomination that I won't mention here, I mentioned in the book, uh, their representatives were there. And he said, I'm sorry, our denomination will not support this. And, you know, why, why won't they? Because this is such a big problem that it will require so government solutions. And we are conservatives and against big government. So we will oppose anything that requires big government solutions. So at that moment, it, it was not theology. It was economic ideology and partisan affiliation that wow. caused the limit. I'll tell you one other little happy ending to that. Not happy ending, but that I didn't tell in the book. Two days later, someone raises their hand and says, you know, the Clean Water Act produced, now I've forgotten the exact number, like a three to one return on investment. He said, um, you know, for every dollar we spent to curb water pollution, we created new technology that made us $3 or $4 or $7, whatever it was. So he said, "There's pro there was profit in clean water. Maybe there will be profit in climate change, uh, addressing climate change. And suddenly all those heads turned and said, oh, we like the sound of that. So. That, um, I, I wish I can say, wow, I'm so shocked that a conservative yeah. evangelical entity would be not on board for, you know, fighting climate change because of the government. There is definitely a pipeline, I think, between this like conservative American evangelical world and this very much a strong aversion to the the word climate change, right? Like yes. because because in my estimation, so many white evangelicals are steeped in talk radio and conservative media and right wing media that I tell people those places plant little landmines in people's heads. Yes, and whenever they hear certain words, no matter who says it, oh my god, liberal, liberal, this is woke. Yes. And, you know, I have to I I have to say this is bad. And climate change is one of those words that has become one of those landmines for people. And what's frustrating to me about this is, again, I want to be clear, like as a former more fundamentalist thinker, 
even back in the day, I was like, guys, I'm not sure what the issue is. If we know that we're polluting and harming the climate, if we know that our climate is shifting and that can hurt people, and mm -hmm. we're called to be good stewards of the planet that God has created in six literal days, of course, obviously, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, don't we have an obligation to do everything that we can to steward this planet well? And the analogy I would use often is, if a friend of mine gave me his Ferrari for the day, which for the record, I don't have any friends who own Ferraris, but if they did and I borrowed one and I, you know, took it off roading and, you know, uh, went, went to McDonald's and just, you know, dumped some fries in the passenger seat and dumped a Coke <laughs> in the back and brought it back full of mud, they would not be very happy because they yeah. entrusted me to respect it and to use it for what it was designed for. Right. So this yes. is not like a mind blowing uh, liberal agenda. This is pretty logical to me. Yet in those spaces, there is such a strong aversion to anything climate change related. And it's very frustrating. Amen to that. It is very frustrating. Let me add two little pieces to this. Um, I, I used when, uh, when Rush Limbaugh was still alive, yeah. I, I used to listen to him for surveillance purposes. <laughs> and uh, I, I used to say to evangelical leaders around the world, but especially around this country, I would say the most powerful leader among Christians in the United States is not Billy Graham. It's not Pope Francis. It's not, and you could mention any number of theologians names. It's Rush Limbaugh. He is, he is in people's heads. Was it three hours a day or three hours think, a day, 12 three to hours. three. And, and so for, for 15 hours a week, there were people who were his disciples. He sat at their feet. Yes. And, and since then uh, Rush, I mean, it's hard to imagine people more destructive th than, than Rush. But, you know, now you add Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson, wherever he'll end up, and all of these other folks who, uh, you know, ha have even more sinister uh, uh, and sometimes scarier personalities. Like w with Rush, you felt at the end of the day, he's an entertainer. He loves attention and he loves money and he's getting a lot of it. And 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 so on. But some of these other people, you get the feeling there are other things going on, you know. Uh, so so yes. all that's to say, yes. yes, we have a generation of evangelical Christians and Catholics. People don't realize there's a parallel mm. thing in Catholicism that have been shaped by a very mean spirited uh, conservatism. Um, but let me say one other thing about the theology, because. This is where you could not, like, I'm thinking of the screw tape letters for everyone who's read. Like, this is something you would imagine screw tape would design. Because what happens when people see the earth is in trouble and you convince them that's in trouble, they say, Jesus is coming back anyway. These are, this is all prophesied in the Bible. It's God's will. In fact, I have had so many people say to this, say this to me, um, Tim. Um, Jesus is coming back. We might as well get all out of this earth that we can while we can. In other words, let's return the Ferrari in as bad shape as we can. Um, that will please God since God wants to destroy it anyway. And this is where, you know, and a lot of people don't understand that eschatology of the rapture never existed in Christian history until the 1830s. It was a gift to Christianity from my denomination <laughs> yeah. that I was born into. So, you know. Thank you, John Nelson Darby. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, just two quick points on this. Number one, you're totally right on the talk radio thing. In fact, I have to, I tell people all the time that white evangelicals are disciples of Tucker Carlson, not of Jesus, right? Yes. That's who they're yeah. following. That's how I kind of frame that, that yeah. same idea. And you're also right. I have noticed and you're talking to someone who my dad was a blue collar business owner. Talk radio was on all day. And I went to work with him a lot when I was a teenager and young adult. There is an evolution of rhetoric that has evolved from your even your Sean Hannity's. There's, there's a reason why Sean Hannity does not speak at Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA event. Right. Mm -hmm. But Tucker Carlson does. Ali Stuckey does. Candace Owens does. And of course, Charlie Kirk does. Yeah. It's a different level. Yes. of rhetoric, of extremism, and of yes. dehumanization. And I, 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 I'm, I'm emphatic about that. So yeah. you're totally correct that like the world that Rush and Sean have built has a, now another layer of yes. just, I mean, Tucker Carlson went to Russia yeah. 
yeah. to interview Vladimir Putin and gave him softball questions and then went to the grocery store trying to demonstrate how much more affordable and how much better the grocery store is in Russia than compared to the U.S. without telling people that the average wage that people make in Russia actually makes that bread much more expensive, right? Like that's yes. the level of propaganda we're talking about here. Yes. Something I couldn't even picture Sean or Rush ever doing. So there's yes. definitely uh, 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 another notch, I think, above of like where yes. we are now. Um, to your other point, this is so important, the theology. I have heard Ali Stuckey, she's a, a right-wing conservative commentator, say from her platform of over, probably a combined over a million followers, that, hey, God is sovereign over all, and the Bible says that the seasons will always, will never really change because God's yeah. sovereign. So no matter what we do to the climate, it doesn't matter because God will sustain it anyway. I mean, that has that was said to millions of people. Yes. Right. And so I agree the theology really matters here, because if you believe that, A, this world's going to burn up one day anyway, and you're going to get raptured up to the clouds or that God is sovereignly in control of the seasons, no matter what man does, yes. that's going to impact how you view the actual data that we have, that yes. actually the world is heating up quicker than ever. And yes. it's going to create major catastrophes and kill a lot of people in the process. Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah. And it's it's heartbreaking. And and this is why. You know, we, yeah, it's, it's why it break, it, it doesn't just make you angry as, uh, I mean, it makes me angry, but it even more, it breaks my heart because you, re and you realize that people say these things and feel pious and they feel they're just repeating what people they trust said to them. Um, and I tell a story near the beginning of the book, uh, my maternal grandfather, uh, Stephen Smith was one of the best human beings I ever met. And I, I mean, on my best days, I hope I'm half as kind as, as he uh, was um, born in, in the 1890s, lived through a, an amazing life, was a wonderful father and a perfect grandfather in my opinion. Um, but he had that theology taught to him. Uh, uh, and I tell the story of we were driving somewhere and I asked him, what happens when we pump all the oil out of the ground? And his answer was, God put all that we need into the earth and it will be there until Christ returns um, and we'll be OK. Well, what I realized, he sincerely believed that there was yeah. no malice in his mind. And he was born in the 1890s for crying out loud, a different world, you know, but that theology is still out there. And young people deserve to not have to follow that uh, way of thinking. I agree. So we, we, we've we talked a lot about doom. My poor <laughs> audience is probably depressed as hell right now thinking, oh my God, it's where if Brian McLaren says that it's it, that, that, that things are doom, we're really in trouble. Let's talk about the life after the yes. doom part, right? Because, yes. and this is arguably mo even more important because most people that you're talking to are well aware of these things. Like I have yes. said very little that is new to them. You probably, you probably have given them some new data on some things, but they all know, you know, the yes. concerns that, that we talk about. Yeah. And it is a very important question to ask, what does life look like, you know, in, in, in the face of so many pressing issues that are affecting a lot of people and could affect, or are, I should say are going to affect future generations, right? I have yes. kids, I have two kids under four, and I have thought about this, like, what's yeah. the planet going to be like in 25 years, 40 years, yeah. 50 years when I'm when I'm not here anymore yeah. uh, for my children? Give us some of your thoughts. What does the life after doom look like? So uh, in the book, when I use the word doom, I'm talking about the trauma that hits our nervous system mm. when we realize that the future will not be the same as the present and the past. Now, we don't know what it will be and all the rest. But we just know there's going to be a lot of change and a lot of turmoil. Yeah. And then I think what happens, I'll, I'll tell you what's happened to me as I've tried to process this. I, I've, I've taken my identity. If I imagine that my identity is fused with the values, it was shaped by the values of our current civilization. Uh, a set of values that is f obsessed with profit, shareholder return, build as much as you can, as fast as you can, and don't worry about the cost you'll deal, you know, the unintended consequences, you'll deal with them later. Um, if I say I've been shaped by that, I've been shaped by that. Totally. Um, uh, uh, and then I say, part of what has to happen is I have to disembed my identity from that set of assumptions and, and try to imagine, is it possible for me to be me 
and live with a different set of assumptions and live with a different set of values. Would I be a better person or a worse person if that happened to me? And my sense is that suddenly a verse from the New Testament, like Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Suddenly it feels like that verse was written for our mm. current situation. Mm. What will what can happen for us is that we will become deeper, wiser people who don't who are not shaped by the assumptions of our current civilization, but begin to see more deeply. And and the irony for those of us who grew up with the Bible and love the Bible, the Bible is going to suddenly make way more sense than it ever made <laughs> because yes. the Bible people haven't thought about this, but when when Jesus was speaking to his fellow Jews in the first century, they were part of an arrangement with the Roman Empire that was making some people very, very rich um, and making mm -hmm. other people very, very poor. And suddenly when you just have that little insight and you read Jesus' parables, they look very, very different. Mm -hmm. And when you read what he says that we think is about the end of the space-time universe, what if what Jesus is talking about is the end of civilization as we know it, the end mm -hmm. of our current socioeconomic structures? Um, it, well, first of all, it turns out to be true because in AD 67, the Jewish people revolted against the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. and, and then they were crushed by the Romans, and the temple was destroyed. Imagine that, you know, uh, the whole center of their religious structure. And yeah. they had to figure out a way of being faithful people who believe and follow God after the very central structure of their religion was shattered. The priesthood was shattered. No more sacrifice. The whole thing. And, and so suddenly you realize, oh, the Bible in many ways is a set of documents helping people cope with the end of whatever civilization they were part of imagining surviving through it and living beyond it. I think that's really wise. Um, it's one of the reasons why I just can't shake the Bible, right? Yes. It's complicated. It's mysterious. I have to undo a lot of my evangelical lenses yes. that I was given to read it in ways that did not do me a lot of um, good in so many ways. But you know, when, when you quoted that verse um, in Romans 12, I was like, Oh, my Awana days are back. I know that verse. I've memorized <laughs> that verse. And it was always used though, right? In the way, in the sense of like, don't be conformed to what we think about culture regarding certain types of music, or if you say certain words, or if you wear certain clothes, or even in my case, have certain haircuts. Yes. That was kind of how that was interpreted. But when you think about it in in the scheme and in, in the context of empire and of of the values the empire has and the values that capitalism has, right? I think that's when it becomes that subversive, upside down kingdom ideal of like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously we're shaped by the world that we live in. We can't get around that. But how do we shape our minds around this kingdom living, so to speak, that makes us think about these systems and the consequences of this particular yeah. empire we find ourselves in and how in this context, it's pillaging the environment and also pillaging other countries and other continents and leaving yes. them massively impoverished while we suck up those resources, right? Yes. And that to me is talking about renewing my mind and not being conformed to the patterns of quote unquote, this world. Oh my gosh, exactly right, exactly right. And and when you think, you, you know, the first thought of a person is, hold it, Jesus couldn't have meant that when he said, um, may your kingdom come. It, it wasn't, could Jesus have meant, may a new way of living, a new value system come in this life? And he wasn't just talking about us going to heaven after we die, he was talking yeah. about a new way of life. And Paul couldn't have meant that when he said, don't be conformed to this world. But then you let it sink in and you think, if that's what Jesus was talking about, if that's what Paul was talking about, they are a thousand times more brilliant and fascinating and yeah. important and relevant to today. Yeah. And uh, what's so sad for me about evangelicals, it, you know, my heritage that I share with you yeah. uh, is that we really cared about evangelism. Mm -hmm. And now in this marriage that evangelicals are made with white supremacists and con artists um, uh, and the fossil fuel industry and uh, all the rest, in that alliance, they're driving people away. They're, they're so, there's almost nobody left they can evangelize. They can yeah. only evangelize people 
who already agree with their politics and all the rest because nobody in their right mind would accept that. And and the irony is we need good news more than we ever need it. If we only had some people who were sharing the good news, uh, that the real good news that Jesus talked about. A hundred percent. People <laughs> ask me often, why why the evangelicals? Why keep new why keep that in, in your title? I'm like, listen, to be an evangelical means to be someone who brings good news. And I don't think evangelicals are bringing good news. Can we bring some good news back? Like, can we say, hey, we have some good news to bring here that isn't rooted in this, you know, supremacy mindset and this mindset of of, of empire and capitalism and and you know, not listen, it's not about for me that people have different political views than I do. I understand that. It's a big world. People are gonna see things differently. Yes. But there's something very unique about this far right media world that just espouses time and time again half truths and whole lies to intentionally get people freaked out about something that isn't as big of a deal as they're making it or that will distract us from real issues you know yes. while really right now in white evangelicalism they are concerned about critical race theory dei initiatives and the quote-unquote groomers which is a dog whistle for queer people like yeah. those are not the biggest issues facing our country right now you know, the predatory school loan system is a big issue. The fact that that during the pandemic, corporations in the ultra wealthy exploded in their wealth while the middle class and lower class lost a ton of wealth. We can't yes. get affordable health care. We can think I can think of uh, 15 more pressing issues yeah. than your concern about a DEI initiative that that Chick-fil-A is doing. Like, who cares about that? My goodness, uh, it's crazy. It, it It's crazy. And here's the sad thing that I never knew when I grew up evangelical. I didn't know that this is not the first time this has happened in, <laughs> yes. in evangelicalism. Yes. Like when you yes. think, you know, I didn't know about lynchings and, and the great migration. Uh, I wasn't taught that in school. I didn't know about it. I learned about it later. Yeah. While lynchings were happening across the American South, Christians across the American South were worried about making alcohol illegal. Um. They, they were trying to not just ban, instead of banning abortion, they were banning, trying to ban alcohol. And so they were obsessed with that and had nothing to say about terrorism against black people and terrorism against white people who believed in the equal rights of black people. That's in our history. My yeah. gosh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so... Yeah, it's uh, but again, it's I suppose part of what writing this book has helped me understand is it's not just evangelicalism that's messed up, and yep. it's not just Christianity that's messed up. Yep, our whole the 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 assumptions of our civilization have proven untrustworthy, and we now are at this point of needing to rethink deeply. And uh, the only question is how much pain do we? We're, we're like an alcoholic who's drinking too much and can't quite admit it yet. And the only question is how much pain are we going to cause ourselves before we hit bottom ourselves and others before we hit bottom? I like to be very pragmatic. As you know, Brian, right. we talk about this a lot, like, okay, let's just get some stuff done here. Yes. You know, I'm, I know, I know that I think about my, I know that I'm in America in 2024 and that I live in an environment where I have to make ends meet. I have kids to take care of. I have to be able to afford healthcare. You know, I, we're a nonprofit. I solicit donations to try and make my income happen yes. plus everything else. Right. And there are just certain things that I participate in that I know are problematic. Um, I use Amazon Prime for business. Um, I know Amazon is problematic, but also like I know that I have a budget to work with and they usually have an affordable price. So we spend yeah. donor money, uh, money wisely, for example, right? That, yes. that, that, that's just one kind of like yes. circle of like, oh, there's tension here. Yes. Do you give, and if you do, what kind of advice do you give the reader of like, hey, here's some steps we can take yeah. as an individual to maybe help be part of the change that we so desperately need to see when it comes to things like climate change and other, other doom scenarios? Yes. So... Uh, Here's what I do in the book. I say there are really only two things that you can do that are really, really significant. Mm. The first is you can vote for people who take the well-being of the earth seriously. And second, you can talk to everybody you can about your concern about the earth and about us having a, a better relationship with the earth. Um, because one of those helps us politically move in the right direction and the other helps us uh, move the social needle that will help us move politically in the right direction. Those are the two big things. 
Lots of other things you can do. You know, for example, I've really cut down on my flying, but I still fly. I, 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 I plan to stop flying um, totally at some point. Um, but the, the truth is, that's not, I'm doing that because of my conscience. It's not because it's a high leverage hmm. change, you know? Um, so what I did in the book is I put an appendix where I, I made a list of all of the kinds of changes in lifestyle that, that you want to do when you don't want to keep harming the earth. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and what I basically say is, look, all those things we can do because we want to, and because we're motivated to, and it becomes part of our trying to set a good example, but the bigger changes are changes of the whole system and uh, our individual work will be overwhelmed by, uh, by the larger uh, currents that are going on in our world. So, Voting is a big deal. Mm. And Catherine Hayo says this all the time. Talking about it is mm -hmm. a big deal. And she's absolutely right. Because talking about it helps let there be a contagion of genuine, sincere concern to counteract the barrage of BS that comes through some of the people we were talking about before. Yeah, I, I love Catherine's work and her book. I think it's called Saving Us. I have it on mm. my shelf. Uh, she talks a lot about how her, part of her work is is being in places that might hear the term climate change and think liberal agenda, but then she shows farmers how, hey, actually the, the, the environment that you're in, we both can see is changing, right? Because the farmers can yes. see how weather patterns are shifting and how you know certain kinds of things are an issue. And so I love her work of being in those spaces, helping people realize that this actually affects them, right? And to think about more sustainable ways that we advocate for a planet that can be more sustainable for future generations, et cetera. Yes. The other thing she said, I'm not sure if you know this off the, off the top of your head, but she said to me something like the amount of emissions that that like the majority of like emissions that come out of the our, our yes. systems, you can fit those CEOs like on a bus. It's like yes. 75 or 80 people. Yes. And that number, I I was like, oh, my God, yeah. like, are you like, wow, yeah. that is mind blowing to me. And sometimes I feel like. There is something to this notion that 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 these companies get almost too big to fail, right? We're like yeah. Amazon, Apple, yeah. Google, uh, et cetera. You know, yes. there's the, we we our mind cannot comprehend the sheer scope and size in terms of volume, money, and reach that yeah. these companies have, and yet they're also some of the biggest exporters of uh, of emissions that are harming the planet, and we participate yes. in that. I have yes. an iPhone, I'm using a Mac, I have yeah. AirPods, like yeah. I'm a big consumer of their yeah. stuff because yeah. I love their stuff and I yeah. need their stuff now yeah. to do this work. So yes. ah, I just get stuck in this cycle of chaos in my head. You know, if, and this is one of our challenges. We, we have to develop not just sort of black, white, good guy, bad guy thinking. We're yeah. all part of a, a system that's bad. And now we have to participate in a transformation of the system. And and in the book, I, I, I uh, outline four scenarios of how that process could go. But uh, the here's the weird thing w when we start thinking about business. Yeah. Um, the in, in some ways, the last 18 months or so have been the most encouraging period of time in all of our work against climate change. Last mm. year, the government of China and the economy of China produced more uh, renewable energy uh, equipment, solar panels and so on, that, that has ever been produced. Um, in, in the past year, we saw a greater increase in the use of renewable energy in the United States than ever before. Battery, the, our capacity to store energy in batteries, expanding like crazy. And a, a lot of that is because of good government policies that then encourage businesses to do good things. But here's the, the right now, I would say business and science are helping us make progress more than religion or government. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but we need all sectors working together because, yeah. you know, my, uh, my friend and one of my heroes, Bill McKibben says, 
um, winning too slowly is the same thing as losing. <laughs> and, and, and that's why we're in a timed test here. And, and yeah, we need all yeah. of us working together with a good attitude and, and avoiding simplistic good guy, bad guy thinking. And, and this is one of the, sadly, it's one of the things that the fossil fuel industry tried to promote. A lot of people don't yeah. know this. But they tried to promote the idea of the carbon footprint so they could make you and I feel guilty about this or that as a way of distract, distracting and deflecting attention from the, the deeper complicity that they have with the problems we face. Well, it kind of so, reminds me when someone like Dan, Dave Ramsey is like, listen, just work hard and make more money and you'll be out of debt. And it's like, well, when your starting salary is a half a million dollars <laughs> compared to like $50,000, it's a very different kind of ball game, right? And that exactly. same kind of thing here where it's like, yes, I get that my plastic straw could be a problem here for the environment, but also compared to, the, you know, comparing Exxon's emissions to my straw is like ridiculous, right? Like there's a much bigger issue at play here. Yeah, that, that's really, that is very helpful, I think, um, for me and for folks out there, because we, I don't know, I, I just, I, I want to do good work. I want to change, you know, um, the systems that we're a part of. And I do think last thought on this for me, I'll hand it back over to you is we've seen the government work with business to do amazing things. I mean, yes. one example of this is operation, uh, or project warp speed, the vaccine yes. initiative, like the Trump administration worked with business and science and they funded it and they worked together and we got a COVID vaccine out in record amounts of time. So government and business, I think do have a role to play and they yes. can work well together to get stuff done. And so I think that's one example of what happens when we put it, when we see things as like an all hands on deck situation and we're all playing our part to hopefully curb climate change. Oh my, uh, well said, well said. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the something that's important to remember is that there are millions of people, maybe a couple billion people who get this and are doing what they can and, and we're leaning, trying to lean in a better direction. Yeah. There really are great people and there are amazing things happening in business and amazing things happening in government. Um, my feeling is the world of religion is really a key player and we need people in the world of religion to show up and to stop being part of the problem and start being yeah. part of the, uh, the solution. Yeah. And when we face the deeper issue, a change in values, a change in our, our relationship with the earth, um, uh, to learn to see the earth as in, in a real sense, God's temple, you know, yeah. that, that this is God's beautiful handiwork, God's art gallery. Uh, and our bodies are not separate from the earth. Every breath we take in means we're taking in part of the earth and, I, I don't mean to be too graphic here. Every time we eat food or go to the bathroom, we're reminded that we take in matter and, and get energy from it and put matter back. We are porous to the earth. We're part of this thing together. And that's, to me, that enhances my spirituality. It makes me sense how I'm joining with God in the healing of the world, or I'm working against God in the desecration of the world every day. And I think it adds a lot of meaning and joy to life when we can join with God in, in loving and healing this beautiful world. I do love how your definition of getting too graphic is talking about, you know, the waste that people, uh, you know, uh, excrete. But hey, that's fine. Uh, I'm all about it. Um, I listen, I, I really agree with you on this. And I think we have a lot to learn from indigenous communities with how yes. they relate to the land. Right. And yes. I am very, very surface level on this. I know very little. I have more work to do on it. But there's something that I've realized um, about my environment and i think this industrialized yes. world we live in that that disconnects us from the earth itself right yes. we 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 don't think about nature and the land as like a living breathing moving thing that has a life yeah. to its uh, you know all in of itself that helps that that is part of the cycle that we all occupy along with humanity right oh. and so that holistic approach i think will give us a renewed sense of respect for the 
the maybe we own property for how we treat our piece of property, how we treat, you know, parks in the forest and and the oceans, because you're right. There is a, um, what they call it. It's like, it's like the fine tuning math, a hypothesis, yes. right, of yes. like, hey, whether we agree on a creator or not, the earth is very dialed in and very fine tuned. Yes. And if we start messing around with some of those levers, it's very <laughs> quick. One domino leads to another and things are way out of whack. And so we have an obligation Right, especially as Christians who believe that God breathed the breath of life into all of this and called yes. it good, yes. that we have an obligation to realize that the energy of God, the life force of God, is in the planet. I'm not yes. saying God is the planet, but yes. God's breath is inside of it, yes. moving it and shaping yes. it. And it's kind of like almost, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but it's almost like, you know, um, it's like almost idolatrous in a sense, or it's just so um, dehumanizing to God, I guess, to, yes. to treat the planet like it's our own garbage pit, because it's yes. just so much more than that. Well, I, I know our time is almost up, uh, Tim, but let me say, I have two chapters in the book. One is called Don't Read the Bible, and then in parentheses, the same old way. And what I, I ask people Love to that. do is rediscover the Hebrew people, the, the, the Jewish people, as indigenous people. Mm. And what we have in the Hebrew scriptures is indigenous people who are resisting colonization. I have some mm. rabbi friends who have an organization called Trua, and their tagline is resisting tyrants since Pharaoh, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> um, but That's awesome. But if we could rediscover the, the Bible as indigenous literature, and then mm. Jesus shows up, a tribal man, a member of a, a brown skinned member of a tribe. And um, who knows his tribal lineage. And he tells us, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. Jesus looks like he's bringing us indigenous wisdom, trying mm. to help us understand our relatedness and ca- connectedness. And the, the and one of the reasons I really hope evangelicals will read this book first is because I think it will help them rediscover treasures in the Bible and in Jesus that that they'll appreciate. But second, in the kind of change that we need, we need people with passion. And yeah. this is something that I, it, a, a place I would love to still have the word evangelical is that passion and, and, and joy and vitality uh, and confidence entering the world with a sense of mission. I, I love that. I, I I think even science is showing us how we're all interconnected. I mean, yes. uh, is, is, I'm, I'm, I always mispronounce her name, but Ilya Delio, I believe it's Ilya her name. Delio, yes. Yeah, she is. I mean, I've heard some of her stuff. I, I've heard some of her talks. I mean, you want... If you want to have your mind blown on, on <laughs> yes. rethinking what, what prayer might or might not be, listen to some of her stuff, you know, yes. how it relates to, to things on the quantum level. So anyway, I'm going to nerd out on that later on. But yeah, I mean, I'm with you on this, right? Like there is something beyond just this um, cultural framework that we've overlaid onto the environment that yes. we live in, right? And, yeah. and it's important for us to not be conformed to that pattern of the world, so to speak, and to think about things through that decolonized lens and also that indigenous lens of like, maybe there's wisdom that we're missing out on because yes. what we've mapped onto our culture um, sure, certainly might have some benefits, but also kind of um, we just lose out on yes. some of the mystical elements, some of the mysticism yes. of like, there's something yes. special happening here and we should see oh. it that way. So I, I think that's really important. I totally agree with you. It's wonderful. Hmm. Well, that was fun. It's a good conversation. Oh, so good. So good. So good. <laughs> Friends, the book is Life After Doom, Wisdom and Courage for a World Falling Apart by Brian McLaren. Uh, book comes out, you said in May. Is that correct? Yes. All right, yeah. I'll make sure I put a link in the show notes. Brian, if folks want to follow, I mean, I'm sure they all know who you are, but in case someone doesn't, in case someone's like, whoa, who's this dude? How can they find your work? Where Are you online, website, yeah. et cetera? So the easiest place is go to my website, brianmclaren.net, um, M-C-L-A-R-E-N.net. And, uh, and then there's links to all my social media there. Awesome, love it. Brian, great talking to you finally publicly. We'll talk more offline. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> 